Okay, Phil. Okay, uh, let me just accept that. All right, Father, you are over every detail and thank you that even these details that are difficult for us to understand aren't for you. The woman, the dragon, the male child, and um, Father, the church, and we know that we're gonna go through tribulation. You've promised that, but you've also promised us delivery through it. For that, we are thankful. We are thankful that we have the privilege of meeting like this, where around the world, there are uh, places where people would be, hmm, maybe even their life would be taken because they open your word, Father. Well, we're opening it and we're doing it boldly because you have let us do that in this country where it doesn't have laws against it. And I pray for Mike as he uh, unfolds what, uh, what uh, the spirit has taught him. And I thank him. Thank you for him in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, let me read chapter 12 and then we'll get, we'll take up where we left off. Um, John writes in chapter 12, starting verse one, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon and the dragon and his angel and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has, have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the blood, um, by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw, that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep away, to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to help the, to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off 
to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Hi, Mary. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. Thank you. I'm a little late. <laughs> Not a problem. Okay. We oh. see Stylo Six. That's Mary. Hey, Mary. <laughs> Hi. Uh, we saw the Mary Jane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, We're last thing in a different way to zoom so it shows yeah. different. Last week, we went through the first two verses and we just got started on verses three and four, but I'm just wondering if there's any questions left from those first two verses on the woman. Are we all clear who the woman is? The church. Uh, yeah, uh, the woman is, represents the people of God. In the first five verses, the woman is Israel. But in verse uh, verses uh, 6 and 13 through 17, the woman is the new people of God, the church. Messiah uh, in as a result of the death, uh, resurrection, exaltation of Messiah, uh, the new people of God is the church. And that uh, remember in Ephesians two, we're told that God that God took Jew and Gentile and made a new man out of them, and so uh, starting in verse six. And, uh, would be the new man. That's after Christ's death, resurrection, and exaltation. So, first five verses, she rep represents the people of God, <coughs> and in particular, Mother Israel. She's being pictured here because she's giving birth to Messiah. And, and verses 6 and 13 through 17, She's the new people. She represents the new people of God, the church. So you see the theme. She represents the people of God. It just depends where in the history of redemption you are, before Messiah or after Messiah. Um, okay. So in verses three and four, the dragon. Uh, that's the second sign that, that John saw in this vision. Um, and the dragon is a mythological monster. And I think we covered this last week. The Old Testament uses monsters to refer metaphorically to Israel's enemies. And I think we looked in, in Psalm 74, uh, verse 14, uses Leviathan to refer to Egypt. In Ezekiel 29, verse 3, Ezekiel talks about the serpent or the beast that lies amongst the streams of Egypt. Um, and then Isaiah, in chapter 27, verse 1, refers to Assyria and Babylon as Leviathan. The red color of the dragon, we said last week, most likely symbolizes his murderous character. John's in John, uh, Jesus in John 8, 44, says two things about Satan's character, his character from the beginning. Do you remember what those two things were or are? He's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Uh, most likely the red color captures the murder part well and we and we've seen we've seen um in the trumpets in the fifth and sixth trumpets that uh that probably the way the demonic horde kills so many people is through lies whispered lies murderous lies and that that captures the dragon, a murderous liar. 
Um, and we said that the crowns represent his ruling authority and the horns signif uh, signify strength and a strong king or nation. So uh, the image that we see in verses um, in verse three of the of the big of the great red dragon uh, suggests to us these this big red dragon, this monster, the enemy of the people of God with multiple heads, multiple horns, multiple crowns, probably indicates that Satan, he's emphasizing here that Satan operates through the kingdoms of the earth. Um, and, and we've seen that. We've seen that in the book of Daniel. Uh, not only in those verses there and not in chapter seven and chapter eight, but also in chapter 10. Remember the uh, Daniel saw this vision in chapter 10 and the, um, and the, and uh, I can't remember if it was Gabriel or if it was an unnamed angel came to him in chapter 10 and told him, that he he was delayed because he was withstood by the uh, the um, uh, the prince of uh, Persia, and that in the context as we follow through there, that is a demon that or demons that influence thinking of the uh, rulers of Persia. But Michael came and helped Gabriel, uh, and Michael withstood the prince of Persia, and Gabriel came and was able to explain the vision to Daniel. Uh, so it's not surprising to us. We've seen that uh, in the Old Testament, that, that um, Satan operates through kingdoms. Uh, through kings, rulers, and authorities. And, and I can't remember if we looked at this passage last week or not. Uh, Revelation chapter 17, 12 through 14 makes it very clear here that uh, the dragon manifests himself through human rulers and authorities. starting in verse 12 and and then i mean and the 10 horns that you saw are 10 kings who have not yes uh the the harlot that was that was destroyed in the trumpet judgments was sitting on a beast uh and he's describing that beast and now he's interpreting what that beast looked like and he's referring to uh the 10 horns, the 10 horns that you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those with him are called the chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, the writers, oh, well, that's it. That's where, that's where I want to stop. But it's very clear there. He says it very clear there that 10 horns are kings through whom the beast or the dragon works. So that, that explains the appearance. That's why John chose that image uh, uh, for Satan, this red monster that has multiple heads, multiple horns, multiple crowns, this, this murderous liar of a of um, um, spirit being that operates through uh, earthly rulers and authorities. Okay. When he says uh, something about the, the red color is uh, it mean like bloodshed. And in particular, uh, referring to his character as a murderer. 
All right, can you repeat the questions? Oh, you didn't hear that? No, I didn't hear, is it Julie? Yes, it's Julie. Yeah, I couldn't oh, hear her. Her than me? Oh, whoops. Sorry. Um, Julie asked, the red color refers to bloodshed. Oh. And I said, yes, it refers, and the bloodshed refers to the fact that he is a murderer, that Satan is a murderer. That's what it emphasizes. Then in verse four, we're told that um, in 12, back in chapter 12, in verse four, we're told that uh, the dragon's tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman. Well, let, let's stop right there. Um, many, uh, many hold uh, that this is referring. There's Nick and Jonathan. Good evening. Good evening. We're in we're in verse four. Yep. Um, many uh, interpret this uh, dragon sweeping down a third of the stars of heaven as um, uh, depicting the time in which uh, that moment in history when some of the angels followed, some of the angels in heaven followed Satan and became his angels. Uh, and um, what makes that a possibility is the Old Testament does refer to angels as stars in Job chapter 38 through uh, 38, 7. When God was creating, Job says the, the, the stars sang for joy. Uh, and um, uh, the, the stars sang, the stars of heaven, I think it might have said sing for joy and that's a most everybody interprets that as a reference to the angels uh joyful uh joyfully praising god as he's creating the universe um uh so it is true that angels are referred to as stars and we saw um and we we saw in Revelation chapter one, angels were referred to as stars. Um, but uh, probably um, uh, it is an allusion to Daniel eight, eight through ten. Let's let's turn there. Daniel chapter eight. Verses 8 through 10. <clears throat> Daniel said, um, this, this is uh, in Daniel's vision of the ram and the she-goat. In, in verses 8 through 10, then the goat became exceedingly great. But when he was strong, and by the way, the goat in this vision represents Greece, so the goat, the goat's rapid uh, destruction of the Persian Empire, conquering of the Persian Empire, was Alexander the Great's rapid destruction of the Persian Empire. Uh, and when the goat became exceedingly great, uh, then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken. At the end of his triumphs, when Alexander made it all the way over to India, uh, he died uh, at a young age, in his 30s, I think he was. Um, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of the four winds of heaven. His kingdom was divided up into four areas amongst his generals. Out of one of them came a little horn 
which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And that history records as uh, Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. Um, it grew great even to the host of heaven. Here we go. Even to the host of heaven and some of the host and some of the stars, it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. In the context, in this vision, that is a reference to how Antiochus IV Epiphanes uh, persecuted the Jewish nation. Um, and this was back in um, around 175, the, the Maccabean revolution, uh, uh, rebellion was against Antiochus, uh, against Roman, uh, against Greek rule under Antiochus. And, um, and uh, anyway, uh, this is a reference to him persecuting uh, uh, Jews under his, his rule. So if this indeed, the, the um, dragging, sweeping down the stars uh, from heaven is a reference to this vision in Daniel. If John's reaching back in Daniel 8 and taking this image to apply to the beast, um, to apply to the devil here in chapter 12, then the sweeping down the stars would probably more likely refer to the dragon's persecution of believers, of Christians. Or God's people in general. It could be before uh, Messiah as well. Uh, but um, it's, it's probably not a reference to the fall of good angels to be bad angels and to follow Satan, but rather a reference to the dragon's hostility toward the people of God. Okay? Remember, we've already, we've already been introduced to this in uh, chapter 11, remember in verse 7, witnesses finish their testimony. The beast will rise up out of the pit and conquer them and kill them, we're told. In the very next chapter, he reaches back to this image uh, um, in Daniel 8, 8 through 10 of, uh, um, of the ruler, the satanically inspired ruler um, persecuting the people of God. He reaches back to that image and uses it to describe this great red dragon. Any questions about that? Okay, so um, it's out of that same opposition to God and hostility to God's people that the dragon is ready to pounce on the woman's newborn child to kill it. That's the picture we're given. He, uh, the dragon has taken his position here in verse 4, and he awaits his victim. What a picture here. The woman is in travail. She's about to get birth, give birth, and Satan is standing before her waiting to pounce on her child as his victim. Um, but um, we see that in verse 5, that he was denied that. Um, but uh, I wanted to point out, we have seen, notice, notice verse 5 says that uh, verse 4 ends with the dragon in position 
to devour the child. But verse five says, um, if I can find it, she gave birth to the male child, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. We'll talk about that in a minute. So he was robbed of his victim, so to speak. Where, where's that at? Verse five. Chapter 12, verse 5. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, pardon? Wasn't tiny. Wasn't tiny. <laughs> uh, but just thinking about, just you have that picture in your mind where Satan is poised to pounce on this male child. One of the things that comes immediately to mind is, is uh, uh, the satanic in, intent in Herod's uh, attempt to kill Jesus uh, in his infancy. Remember? Matthew 2, first 18 verses, uh, the Magi tell him where uh, the star appeared, and the prophecies say uh, that Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, and, and so obviously uh, Christ is at most two years old at this time when the Magi come. And when Herod learns of where um, Christ was to be born and that these magi saw the star over Bethlehem, he gets this idea to send his soldiers to Bethlehem and kill every male child um, under uh, two years and under. And, and so... Uh, we didn't hear that. Michael, repeat it when after well, go ahead. finishes. There's no reason he should be able to. She's closer than I am. You can just repeat it. Yeah, she, go again. Well, it's the same thing what happened uh, back in Moses' time when the, they. Uh, they also went trying to find the the uh, the um, when they were trying to find Moses when he was little, they tried to do the same thing to drown the yeah. newborn yeah. babies. Yeah, yeah. But here in Matthew chapter two, we need to repeat it. Oh, she said this is the same. This is similar to what they did in Moses' day when Pharaoh ordered the drowning of all the Jewish males babies uh but what's different here this yes that was and i'm no doubt that was satanically inspired too but he, but here matthew 2 we we see uh uh satan's attempt to go after the child mm -hmm. he was poised and ready to devour the male child and uh, and we see that in matthew chapter 2. We also see it um, in the devil's attack of Jesus in the wilderness in the first 13 verses of Luke 4. It's also the first 11 verses of Matthew 4, but the very first verse said the Spirit led him into the wilderness uh, where he was to be tempted by the devil. And you can read the exchange between Jesus and the devil in those first 13 verses. And the devil was trying to get him to um, act independent of the Father. And why do you suppose the devil was trying to get Jesus to act independent of the devil? Of the Father. Of the Father. <laughs> why do you suppose he was, the devil was trying to get Jesus to act independent of the Father? Because probably he, among other things to prove he wasn't God. Uh, it it would uh, it would certainly um, prove he wasn't committed to God, was it? Would it? Yeah. 
What, what were you going to say, Pam? Just Not my will, but thine be done. That he would be disobedient. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, try to get him to be disobedient. Like this. Okay. And, yeah. And, and completely foil all of God's yeah. plans for redemption. So this picture, and then, and then you see it again in John chapter 13, verse 2. Uh, the devil, the devil put it in the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. That's John 13, 2. And then John 13, 21 through 30 is the account. I found this on the web. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, and um, John uh, verses 21 through 30 in John 13 is the account of um, how Jesus said that one of them was going to betray him and it was going and he he said it's going to be the one that I hand the morsel to and he handed it to Judas and he told Judas uh, what you do do quickly and uh, and the text says at that point Satan entered Judas and he went out and it was night um so anyway or yeah uh anyway you can see through the gospels this murderous intent of the devil so when you're when you're reading through these these things in the gospel think of this picture here in revelation chapter 12 verse 4 how the devil was poised and ready to pounce on the male child. And he knew what he was going to be for us, you know? Yeah. You know Did you hear that? No. Uh, Julie said, uh, um, John, John knew that the, say that again? I said he knew already what, what was gonna you know what christ was gonna do for us that's why satan was the de devil did know? yeah mm -hmm. yeah she said the devil knew what christ was going to do for us and that's why he was re trying to destroy uh christ okay then in verse five we're to we're told that uh she gave birth to a male <clears throat> child one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Um, and uh, so she gives birth to the male child, uh, which, by the way, giving birth, the woman giving birth to the male child is probably a reference right back to Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 15, where um, the seed of the woman uh, there's going to be enmity between the seed of the serpent and and uh, the um, uh, the seed of the woman was going to um, bruise the head of the seed of the serpent, and the serpent was seed of the serpent was going to bruise the heel of the of um, the seed of the woman that's probably that male child is probably a reference back to that prophecy but anyway the woman gives birth to a male child who is destined to rule the nation with an iron scepter and this in those verses i've got indicated there genesis 49 10 uh, jacob's blessing of judah and then psalm 2 verses 7 through 9 um uh this description of of male child who would rule the nations with an iron scepter uh identifies this male child in verse five as the messianic son of david the christ messiah so that description uh a male child who is destined to rule the nations with an iron rod that identifies him as Messiah, the Christ. Okay. But the surprising thing here 
in verse five is that John moves quickly right from the birth of Christ directly to his ascension and his exaltation without even mentioning Christ's life, ministry, death, and resurrection. He just jumps from the birth to the ascension and exaltation. Now, John's first readers would not have been in the dark here. They would have known all about Jesus's life, death, resurrection, uh, um, but what was John trying to emphasize by skipping those, just going, he given us the picture of this dragon poised, ready to pounce on the male child. She gave birth to the male child and he was caught up to heaven and the throne. Why do you think he shared it like that? What is, trying, what is he trying to emphasize here? The dragon wasn't able to uh, pounce on Christ. Right. The dragon was not able to pounce on Christ. Uh, and uh, that Christ conquered the dragon when he rose from the dead and ascended to take his seat at the right hand of God. That, after his birth, that being caught up to heaven, um what's in, in what's what's um included in, in that being caught up to heaven is his resurrection and ascension him being caught up to heaven and up to the throne uh reminds his readers that it was christ's death and resurrection and exaltation that defeated the dragon that's he didn't have to mention his life and ministry and all and all of that. His readers already knew that. He was trying to emphasize that it was Christ in his death, resurrection, and exaltation that defeated the dragon. You get ready to ask something, Jonathan? No, I, I was just, it was one of those aha moments. <laughs> ah, yes. Yes. Uh, so okay. Um, so you know automatically he was the Christ just upon being born, which meant his power was right there, right then. And if the dragon's waiting for him, then it doesn't matter because at the point of his birth, he, he's the Christ and thus he can defeat that. It was exactly, exactly. And we're going to see we're going to be we're going to see some of that in just a minute when we talk about the wilderness here but yes exactly now i love the way this one guy this guy peterson uh puts it he he says verse five uh in verse five he says this is not the nativity story we all grew up with but it's <laughs> the nativity story all the same and i think that's that's really true. Uh, the nativity story, Christmas after Christmas, is emphasizing the child in the manger. But John emphasized as soon as this male child was born, boom, he was caught up to heaven. And that, that process of being caught up to heaven and to the throne was the decisive defeat of the dragon, of Satan. Not the nativity story we grew up with, but the nativity story all the same. How, how do you, Mike, superimpose that on the nativity story? Uh, who was there physically? No. To grab the child from her when she delivered him? Um, I think... I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but I think. Well, where this was picture, this dragon? Where was this dragon in the at the time that Jesus was born? He was he was influencing the the Jewish leadership, influencing 
uh, Herod and and Rome, okay. uh, and they were they were um, searching for messiahs. Rome was searching for anybody that claimed to be a messiah and would stir up unrest and cause a, a rebellion. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, the Herod was alerted to the uh, birth of the king of kings by the Magi. And of course, Herod didn't like that. Hearing that the king of kings was born, he took as a threat to his own kingship. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, Satan working behind the scenes, working through rulers and authorities, as we saw in his description in verses three and four, um, he's stirring these people up against Christ. And so we see Jesus wasn't even two years old. And and Satan inspired, instigated um, uh, Herod's attempt to kill Christ when when he was a toddler or in his infancy. So the dragon had a presence there. Herod and the rest of the gang that wanted to get rid of him. Yeah. Now, how you capture this verse five in a nativity scene to put up on your mantle? I don't know. <laughs> um, so anyway but even before even way before it all started pardon even before it all started what started uh, you know uh, Satan trying to get to all this not to happen right He's putting all kinds of stumbling blocks you know yeah Yes, exactly. Maybe the beginning. Yes, he did. That's, uh, yeah, back in Genesis chapter three. And, oh, um, Julie said, I'm just not understanding why this isn't, why it's picking me up and not her. Doesn't make sense. I'm going to turn around like this. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Okay. Um, uh, Julie said that that Satan's opposition to God's plan started uh, long before uh, uh, the picture that we have here in verse five, and absolutely it did. It started in in the garden in Genesis three. Okay, and then in verse 6, um, John sees that uh, after the male child was caught up to God and to his throne, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. So after the birth of an exaltation of Messiah, uh, the woman obviously uh well like i said earlier uh after the birth and exaltation of messiah the woman symbolizes the new people of god the church and she flees to the wilderness to be protected and nourished by god for 1260 days so now we've already addressed the 1260 days uh many times and uh We'll do it again when we get into to, uh, um, chapter 13. Uh, but what is this wilderness? What is this place that uh, God has prepared for her to be nourished during this time? Remember, we said the 1,260 days represents the entire uh, time between Christ's ascension and his return the tribulation runs from jesus's ascension to his second coming 
and uh, and is referred to as time times and half a time or 42 months or 1,260 days. So that's representing the entire tribulation period from his ascension to his return. But what is this wilderness? Is this a place? Uh, is this a geographical place that, that God has reserved for the woman? Well, in your notes there, I've got uh, the wilderness historically the wilderness is a place where the people of god are exposed and dependent upon him for israel it was the sinai peninsula um and um these passages in exodus just uh, uh are about the the jews just liberated from exodus i mean yeah from um from uh, Egypt via the Exodus, just liberated, they enter the wilderness. We're told in Exodus 16, 1, and in the first two verses of Exodus uh, 19. And in Numbers, uh, we're told that they wandered for, uh, for 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, so uh, the Sinai Peninsula historically was a place where the nation of Israel was exposed and completely dependent upon God. Uh, this, the Sinai Peninsula back then was their wilderness wanderings, their wilderness journey. For Jesus, it was an unknown region beyond the Jordan, and uh, you can see that in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, if somebody wants to read Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. For 40 days, being tempted by the devil. That's good. That's good. So uh, he was he returned to the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So his wilderness was an unknown region. We don't know where where uh, this wilderness was that he we don't know the exact identity. Uh, our geographical identity of this wilderness in which he was tempted by the devil. Uh, but we're told it was beyond the Jordan. Okay. For the church, because remember, this is what this is what John is talking about now in verse six. The woman after the death and exaltation, exaltation of Messiah, the woman represents the new people of God, the church. So the church flees to the wilderness and is nourished by God for the entire time of their tribulation. Uh, so what is the wilderness for the church? We understand Sinai Peninsula was the time and place where the nation of Israel was completely exposed and dependent upon God. We understand this unknown region beyond the Jordan was the wilderness where Jesus was exposed and dependent and dependent upon upon God. What about the church? What is the church's wilderness? Um, well, uh, Christ, it, isn't it? Pardon? Isn't it Christ? No, he's not the wilderness. No, I mean, he's the one that nourishes us in yeah. the wilderness. Okay. So remember the wilderness <laughs> The wilderness would be where we're exposed. Okay. Okay. Exposed. Um, um, Jesus, God, the triune God's the one that nourishes us in our wilderness. Okay. Uh, and so what is this wilderness for the church? Do you feel like you're in a wilderness journey right now? <laughs> Maybe some days it feels like you're out in the wilderness. Um for the church, the wilderness represents life 
in the present evil age from crisis say that again uh for the church the wilderness represents uh the a life in the present evil age from jesus's ascension to his return it's our life in the present evil age that certainly works for me yes yeah. <laughs> mike i wanted to ask you about the definite article in front of wilderness is that really in the greek v like it's uh, not a i'm not sure even if it is a definite article you're supposed to have the greek memorized mike yeah, well, I don't. I'm looking for the Greek Testament here, and I'm not seeing it. Uh, oh, now I see one. Can you hear him? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Revelation 12, 6. Uh, yeah, there is an there is an article there. Uh, but not A, but the yeah, yeah. Um, so a specific wilderness, but you have to ask the question: what wilderness? And it is it's the church's wilderness. It's the time that that they are exposed and dependent upon God. Uh, during their tribulation, during their trial, and uh, and that would be this present evil age between Christ's ascension and his return. That's the time of trial uh, that the church uh, is in. So that's our wilderness. That's our wilderness. Yeah. So just so what verse six is saying is just as God nourished both Israel and Jesus in in their wilderness experience, uh, so He will provide for the church during the entire time of tribulation. And. Um, the point is this, that even though the dragon wages war against the church, and as we've seen in previous chapters, puts some of them to death, God is protecting his own from apostasy and enabling them to endure the onslaughts of Satan. That's what he's talking about here in verse 6. So the church, after the Messiah is caught up to heaven in his throne, the church uh, uh, finds themselves in this wilderness. This time between when Christ goes back to heaven and before he returns that time period where we are exposed and dependent upon him. Remember chapter 11, the witnesses, which is the church, are both protected and vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, chapter uh, 6, the, uh, the souls that were under the, the beheaded souls that were under the altar, mm -hmm. uh, they were protected but vulnerable <coughs> so once christ was caught up to heaven and to his throne that was his decisive defeat of satan but until he comes back the church is in their wilderness the church is um protected nourished yet vulnerable mm -hmm. We're vulnerable to Satan's onslaughts, that God protects us 
from apostasy. That is, Satan in his allurements and in his attacks does not succeed in causing us to deny the faith, to apostatize. Uh, uh, so God protects us from the destruction of our faith and spiritual life, and he enables us to endure the onslaughts of Satan. So that's the picture we have in verse 6. Um, so John used the wilderness, this image of the wilderness, as a symbol of uh, this time in which the church is both protected and vulnerable, protected from from uh, by God from Satan's wrath, but vulnerable. I mean, protected by God from God's wrath, but vulnerable to Satan's wrath. Mm -hmm. This is one thing that um, the, from the first time I saw this movie about John the Baptist, the part where he was being beheaded mm. and they were telling they were telling him they're going to be beheaded and there's one thing that he said and then i never forget it where he says if you kill me you will free me <laughs> yeah yeah i thought that was really cool i go yes this makes sense mm. <laughs> <laughs> you're free from everything else you know from from the world of the all the stuff that's you know i go wow the it really Being made sense. From the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what verse 11 says uh, in chapter 12. And they, that is a, a reference to believers, the they in, in verse 11. And they have conquered him, that is the dragon, Satan. Believers have conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb. That's the primary way. That's the primary cause of our victory by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So even when the when believers are committed to confessing Christ and proclaiming his gospel, even more, I mean, even in the face of the threat of death. They spill uh, their testimony with their own blood. That's defeating Satan. Uh, and that's kind of reminiscent of what you were saying about John saying, even when you behead me, I'll be free. Yeah. Um, one last thing I want to say about the wilderness, then we'll close. Um, uh, or Let's see. I guess it's, let's just say this one last thing for next week so we don't have to rush through it. Okay. All right. So we'll uh, we'll save this one last thing about the wilderness, the wilderness being a place and time of testing. We'll cover that next week and then we'll get into the, the war that's in heaven that we see in verses uh, 7 through 12 see what that's all about okay so what i want to do is um i'm going to ask pam to close us in prayer and then i'll stop the recording and then you have you have questions let them fly or if you just want to chit chat that's fine too but uh pam if you want to go ahead and close us in prayer Father, thank you for this time to be together studying the book of Revelation. Uh, thank you for our brothers and sisters here. And we thank you so much that you are with us in the wilderness and that you uh, are protecting us as we go through this, uh, this world and, and this time of tribulation. Amen. 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 Okay.